because in Capoeira there are no winners and there are no losers. Hello, 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 welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 404. And today, my guest is Mr. Tarek Alsala. I'm Jeremy, I'm your host. I love martial arts, and that's why Whistlekick was born, because my love for martial arts needed to turn into something. And here it is, it's my career. And that's why I come to you twice a week with this show, and that's why we do so many other things, from First Cup, every weekday morning, to Marshall Journal, to the products that we have at whistlekick.com and at Amazon. Now, if you check out those products at whistlekick.com, whether that's uniforms or sparring gear or apparel, you can save 15% using the code PODCAST15. A lot of people start martial arts. Some of them continue, and some of those folks turn into instructors. But a very small percentage of those people, and we've had a few on the show, have turned their instruction into a greater mission, something that reaches beyond the boundaries of style or system or even country. Well, today's guest is one of those people. Mr. Tarek Al Salah is engaged in spreading capoeira throughout the world through an organization he founded called Capoeira for Refugees. On today's episode, we talk about his start, why he's so passionate, not only about capoeira, but also about spreading this beautiful martial art to some who otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity, and in some ways, folks who need it more than anyone else. So let's welcome him to the show. Mr. Al Salah, mm-hmm. welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hello, thanks for having me. Of course, thanks for coming on. We, we've got a little bit of a time difference here. It's, it's early here, it's far less early there. <laughs> But I appreciate you doing this. I appreciate you coming on and and yes, I'm to getting to know you. I'm just moved to Berlin, so we have midday right now, so it's all good. Just had some lunch. I'm ready to talk. <laughs> well, good. You've had lunch. I haven't had breakfast yet. I tend to wait a little bit, so we'll we'll be we'll be wrapping up, and I'll be running into the kitchen to grab some food. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of things that we can talk about, and, and I'm sure the listeners are already picking up. Okay, so we've, we've got somebody who's living in Europe. We've got someone who has, you know, a bit of an accent. You know, at least if you're an American, you have a bit of an accent. And, you know, what, what, is, what does all this mean? What's happening? What's going on? And I know we're going to get there, and I'd rather we just kind of find our way there organically. But we always ask our, our guests kind of the same question. It's a great jumping off point. So I'm going to ask you that same question. How did you first find martial arts? Um, okay, I mean, you know, as a, as a kid, you definitely, you know, you, you watch TV sometimes, you know, you see martial arts here and there, you think like always, oh, that's cool, that's cool. And um, most of the martial art you see, and they, it, 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 looks, it looks quite tough. So you think like, hmm, maybe next life, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> this happens to me. Um, with capoeira as well. Basically, in, I grew up in Germany. I'm half German, I'm half Syrian. Uh, I grew up in Germany and um, outside Jamaica in Cologne uh, is the, basically the biggest reggae festival um, you know, in Germany, Cologne. And so I was just there um, with my tent, my friends, and they had friends. So, and then the, my tent neighbors basically start playing capoeira in the morning and uh, I just joined. And this is basically how I really found martial arts, basically through, you know, friends have something in common. And I was always into sports. Um, and uh, yeah, this, those were my, my first steps into capoeira, um, because also I know if you, um, you know, do something professionally, it was also really, yeah, like I said, discouraging, um, especially in capoeira, where, you know, people flying through the air creating a circle if you're part of the circle that's great you're part of you know the family but if you're outside the, per- uh, the circle you you often think they're doing you know their own ritual maybe you don't you feel shy you don't want to join them um that's by the way one of the policies we have when we're working with capoeira um in you know war and conflict zones basically no one is really allowed to watch um 
we're not sending people back, of course, but they have to at least clap yeah, in the rhythm. They have to be part of the circle. I think that's really important um, for the work we are doing. Wow. So for the folks listening who have never watched Capoeira, maybe if you've seen some of the movements, what you're referencing here, of course, is is the circle de hora mm-hmm. that, yeah. Yeah. that in, in which Capoeira is played. And one of the things I've experienced, I've done a couple years of Capoeira and had the chance to play a little bit off and on. Other martial artists, people who are, you know, have spent decades training in let's call them more conventional arts, karate, taekwondo, kung fu, etc. Mm-hmm. Look at Capoeira. And, and we have an event where we bring together people of all different martial arts. And, and the class that attracts some of the most attention, but also the most anxiety, is the Capoeira. Because you have different movements, but you also have the dance quality. And it can be really nerve-wracking for someone to jump in and, and start moving in that way. Were you at all nervous? You know, this when when your friends are here at this reggae fest, and and you know, you just did you really just kind of jump in, or did that take some encouragement? Um, well, I think it's it depends. When you, uh, for example, for me, it was easy um, to to jump in because they're my friends, right? So it's basically it's like a new situation for you and never been there before then it's of course like a big step to go in the middle of a circle everybody's watching you and there's like kicks and you know don't want to get hurt and you know, don't look foolish and so forth but um let's say for, for myself um because i knew the people i i don't really care um, you know you just go in you're part of it you you don't have a lot you, you basically really relaxed about it and once you know, you're part of the circle, you have friends, you do stuff with them again over, not just capoeira, go for a drink, whatever. Um, you don't really care if you look, you know, clumsy or whatever, you just join it. And I think, let's say in capoeira, um, one thing um, which takes capoeira apart from many other martial arts, if, if you will say so, is because in capoeira there are no winners and there are no losers. So um, if I hit you, you know it's my fault, right? So those old rituals that, you know, creating a circle um, and, and uh, everybody sees each other, you, you give your energy, you sing, you play music, or everybody basically choose, you know, their own level of participation. And uh, if you're in the middle and you don't have the stress anymore that, you know, somebody hits you very hard or something in Capoeira, especially as a beginner, then you're basically getting also more relaxed because I would trust you not to hit me. And I think this is something you learn with time in Capoeira, but uh, when you're just saying about you know, people going into the circle, I think this is something uh, with, with, I think it's really important to voice more, especially in Capoeira, because it's so hard to get into the sport Capoeira because there's not a lot of beginner classes, right? Mm-hmm. Because people saying like, oh, that looks great. Maybe next life, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And, and you hit on something that I, I just want to underscore for the listeners, because I think it's, at least from my perspective, the biggest difference between Capoeira and every other martial art that I'm aware of and have practiced. And that's what you said. If I hit you, it's my fault. The way we talk about other martial arts, if I hit you, whether we say it, jokingly or seriously you failed to block you failed to avoid that but in capoeira because of of just the the way it is practiced the responsibility is on the person throwing the technique to be sure they're not throwing something that is beyond their control yes and you're right and this is something really beautiful on you know capoeira it's you know if, if you're a beginner and, and it, it's like the older the elderly is taking care of the newcomers, right? The strong is taking care of the weak. Mm. You know, those, let's say, values are part of capoeira. It's really part of capoeira. Of course, you have sometimes like people, rivals, you know, they're the same level, strength, whatever, you know, and they're fighting with one another and then, and, and, and yeah, people getting hit and so forth. But this is, um, that, that's not so common, basically. It happens, of course, but then after the order, after the play, you know, Things stay in the game, and then there's also outside the game. So, 
think also, you know, in Capoeira, because you're in the middle, um, let's just say I mentioned that before. So with Capoeira and the organization Capoeira for Refugees, which I, I founded a long time before the war in Syria started. Uh, so we working with, you know, at that point with, you know, like three children in prisons, in women's shelters, um, in with Iraqi and Palestinian refugees, and so forth, basically through Capoeira, um, those kids, they got a lot of confidence. Going into the circle again gives them a lot of confidence. If you like, you know, live on the streets or in the prison, you don't really get a lot of attention. So people are attention seeking, especially, you know, if you grow up, I have two kids, you know, they get so much attention all the time. They're so cute. You know, you, they, they want something you listen. Otherwise they just keep doing it. So basically you grow up with getting a lot of attention. And then when we're getting older and older, we get less and less. So I think everyone is, needs some sort of, you know, this sort of protection. And <clears throat> basically in Capoeira, you can express yourself. Um, and release your anger and frustration in a healthy way, again, without really needing to hit somebody and learning at the same time as well. Uh, because at the end of the day, you're friends. You have to play with one another and not against one another. And I've always liked that, that verb, play, because it's, it's the, again, it's the only martial art I'm aware of that we use that verb. If I tell someone, hey, I heard you play karate, they'll be offended. But if I yeah. tell someone I heard that you play capoeira, there there won't be any offense taken because that is that is kind of for those who haven't seen it, haven't participated, that really is the best verb. There's a there's an element of of fun and lightheartedness that comes through in a game of capoeira. You have people who are um, jokesters and and you know will will play tricks on people. Mm. Yeah. And and I've always enjoyed that quality of it. So if we go back, so here you are, you know, reggae festival, and and you 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 jump in because your friends are doing it, and you just mentioned that you've set up a, a foundation, an organization, a couple of for refugees, but obviously a lot of stuff happened in the middle. You, you you don't just go from hey this seems like a neat thing to do with my friends to dedicating so much of your life to it. So what was it about Cabuera that you found so compelling? Um, it's, it's a combination, I would say, um, with, you know, music, singing, playing instruments, building instruments. I mean, you know, in Capoeira, it's, you know, the instruments also look pretty cool because you have this thing which looks like a bow. You can use it as a bow. It makes a really nice sound. You hear it out from far away. It's, it's very special, the bidding bow, of course. Um, and you have drums. And uh, you have this agogo, which looks like you're playing on two coconuts, basically. And it's, it's something, I feel, which draw me really into capoeira. It's the energy you hear being part of something. It's not only the movements, it's, it's also the, the, the whole thing, the combination of, yeah, singing, play music, call and response. There's so much energy, basically, happening in capoeira. Um, which I think draws me and a lot of other people into Capoeira, uh, first of all, because, you know, it's also nice. It's, for example, when you're going back to Germany, Cologne, um, in Capoeira, you find a lot of people with, you know, different nationalities um, from all over the world. Um, it's also very special in Capoeira. There's lots of women, girls also play Capoeira, um, probably half of it as well. So it also brings all this masculinity, like, out of the, you know, the competition and the testosterone, which you find in so many martial arts, a bit mm -hmm. out of it. So that's also something where I really like, you know, Capoeira is a bit more relaxed. Um, basically, the winner in Capoeira is who has the most fun. That's the winner in Capoeira, right? And this is something what I teach my kids as well. And I think everybody should teach this somebody else as well, because it's not about winning, it's not about losing, you know, with sports where it brings us, you know, big, you know, competitions, all about winning. Everybody has to win. Competition, of course, it's good to, you know, it drives you, you, you give everything, you go more. And that's also fine. But also, you know, I think there's also the other side of it, which is, like I said, having fun. And this is, 
something which is the most important in Capoeira. That's, let's I say, this is something why I feel Capoeira for me um, is, is the sport which I like. I want to call it sport, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But there isn't a great word to describe martial arts. I mean, we, some, we call it sport or, or pursuit or hobby, and, and none of those things really ever seem to fully encompass all the different elements. Um, you know, for me, it's a way of life. And I suspect for you and for most of the listeners, it's a way of life, if not their entire life, certainly a, a big portion, not just in what they do, but in the way they think. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. And yeah, you, yeah, like I said, I don't, I, I mean, I can keep on talking about this topic. It's basically <laughs> the, um, yeah, try to do, uh, you know, those have healthy, a healthy lifestyle basically this is also of course part of it and then you get used to it and you can't live without it anymore and your friends suddenly doing the same thing and so forth i mean that's basically what happened to me you know while i was practicing capoeira mm. back that day on this uh, reggae festival <laughs> ages ago um yeah so one um, yeah that that's i feel for me and probably for lots of other things the, the thing which Force you into it. What, what is your friends are doing, basically? Yeah. Now I'm I'm curious. You 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 mentioned this organization that you've put together, but from what I know of people who start organizations like this, it usually comes out of some personal story, personal need. Sometimes, what was it from your life that caused you to start Caboeira for Refugees? Um. Okay. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's, there were a couple of things always, you know, coming together. In, for example, in, in Germany, um, I was running a gym in Germany, in Cologne. Um, I was totally overworked. Um, you know, a lot to do, basically. Uh, my uh, girlfriend left to Brazil. Um, the weather was crap. And <laughs> basically, I, I was just working and I got, like, I had shingles. Uh, in my 20s, which is very early. So singles usually get when you're really stressed and um, a bit older usually. And uh, so I wasn't allowed to work anymore. I, I was like a totally workaholic. And um, so I moved to Syria just to have a break first of all for three months. And uh, ended up in a small room uh, in Damascus you know, with Britney Spears and take that posters on the wall. <laughs> they charged me, and I speak Arabic, because they don't have students, I speak Arabic. They uh, charged me lots of money, and but I love the country. I really love to have that other side, to sit with that dude in the, in the you know, in the bazaar and playing chess and drinking tea the whole day. So I love this. And this is something that was really missing in my life. Mm. Um, so I love, first of all, the country a, 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 a lot. and. Um, but what really started um, or what helped me basically is, let's say, for this experience of, you know, living in that small room and basically paying a lot for my rent. I started a real estate agency, Yellow House, um, which gives me, let's say, the financial freedom to do or to risk more what I want. Because I'm pretty sure lots of people want to do something with their passion and their sport, but it's often really difficult to you know, go hunting, uh, let's say, to, uh, to sit by the fire and do what you really want if you go have to hunt for, for things all the time. So you, mm -hmm. I, I was in that luxury position uh, back in 2006 in Syria. And then uh, I just kept practicing capoeira. And uh, Syria is um, a very young country. I don't know how where you live, but in Germany, it's almost like 40 is the average of people. You have basically lots of old people uh, like me. In, in Germany, in Syria, I was like 16. So you have kids everywhere, 24 hours. It's a really young city. And of course, the energy is totally different if you have children everywhere. And we, so I was practicing on the streets of you know, Damascus, um, you know, playing, singing. Kids came all the time. I couldn't really practice myself. I was like, okay, guys, let me practice. I rent a place, and this is where we can practice together. So this is what was basically the early days. Started in a really beautiful Arabic house. Kids came, they brought their friends, they brought their friends, they brought their parents. And um, yeah, and then, like I said before, so we worked with you know, refugees, street children, and so forth. Basically, developed really 
as a grassroots initiative uh, back that days. Um, but so, but going back to Germany because I you know had shingles um, because I had a really comfortable life, <laughs> you know, earning money, having you know a car, you know, all of those things basically, which most of the people think they're important. For me, it wasn't really important. For me, it was like, okay, what's next? And Syria basically gave me this, um, this missing path. I could really do what I feel felt right, right? N not easy. I was doing the right thing. And um, running an organization, like uh, the grassroots initiatives, is um, extremely time-consuming, very hard. Um, you have to deal with people, trainers. Uh, we also work with, you know, UNICEF on Save the Children and, you know, all those international organizations. So you're basically getting a lot of red tape, paperwork, bureaucracy. And um, when you, you know, let's say what I'm really passionate about capoeira and teaching capoeira, so I'm teaching here in Germany again capoeira because I had the last 10 years, I spent a lot of time behind the computer filling in log frames, indicators, outputs, <laughs> basically trying to uh, please, let's say, those, those big eight money system um, to make sure I fulfill my contractual obligations, basically. And um, yeah, this is basically really what it's uh, your soul. And um, yeah, so I, this is how it basically started with Capoeira for Refugees, just because of yeah, I, I just felt it just felt right, and you get a lot of energy from it while you're teaching. Every teacher uh, knows that, but running an organization is something else. Mm. Everyone out there who's ever instructed, especially anyone who's run a school, knows that a martial arts instructor, regardless of the style, takes a lot of weight on their shoulders. We become responsible for the upbringing, not just in class often, but outside of class, the personal well-being. And I know many martial arts instructors who have a hard time sleeping because somebody somewhere in their school is always having a challenge. You're talking about working specifically with a population that has a little bit of extra stuff to deal with, a little bit of extra responsibility on you to care for these people. Does that weigh on you? Um, yes or no? Um, you have to. You have to be the right type um, of, of of person. I mean, by me, um, for example, we're dealing a lot with children who with mental health issues with really, really low attention span. If you talking right now in Syria or let's say in refugee camps where we work, and um, those kids, for them, it's the highlight of the day or the month or in when they see capoeira, basically. You are always the poster project. So you give them a lot of fun. They're having, you give them an instrument. Next week, they play better than you. So you see, you know, all the struggle they're going through as well, because you cannot just teach capoeira. You also sit and drink your tea. Uh, it wouldn't work otherwise, you know, being friends, and, you know, getting the families involved and so forth. So you hear a lot of really heartbreaking stories. Um, but I feel like you also have to toughen up because if you, you know, let this, you know, um, getting into you, then you cannot do your job anymore. Your job is there to bring, you know, happiness and stay very positive, um, and give a lot of, um, hope and yeah, happiness basically to the children. The, um, for example, we have a lot of volunteers coming to us. Um, wanting to work with us as well. And it's really difficult sometimes because, yeah, if, like I said, if you're not, we had volunteers who start crying in a refugee camp, then you also have to take care of them. They're even really good teachers, really good teachers. But if, if this is not made for you, then um, it, it's probably not something you should pursue at all. Um, but let's say wait on me, I, I never really felt that so much because I also saw that what we're doing is really the right thing. And, you know, this is all I can give, basically. And like I said, you have to be positive 
you know who you are and take care of yourself before you're helping somebody else so um yeah i, I, I feel that's that's a little bit of route i would i would take mm. sure martial arts instructors no matter where they are or who they're teaching always end up with great stories i have stories that would would make people surprised i have stories that would gross you out i have stories that that only another martial arts instructor would ever say, yeah, I've, I've seen that. When you think of your time playing capoeira, traveling, working with new students, old students, what, what's your favorite story? What's, what's the best one that you can tell us? Oh, and it really depends how much time you have. <laughs> as much so time as stories. you want. Um, let's say there's a, a story I, I like, um, which like basically visualize the you know, say the power of you know sport music plays so much. It's uh, it was around two thousand nine. It was a project in Jeramana, which is south of Damascus, and then UN school. <clears throat> so basically, uh, um, UN asked us if we basically could run a project for them, integrating um, Iraqi children um, you know, into society, and yeah, basically training them capoeira. And we were like four teachers, a very sunny day, um, half an hour bus ride going south of Damascus, basically lots of kids on the playground in, in a school. And the bell rang and, you know, kids went inside. And um, so half of our group, it was like two trainers, basically, or three trainers, we were trained like the boys, like around 20 Iraqi refugees. And uh, the girls that trained separately in, in inside because it was very conservative, so you couldn't really mix them. Um, so we played capoeira, had a good time, music and so on. But suddenly started to rain uh, rocks and you know stones on us from over the wall, and so we had to run for it. And we were like hiding. And I was asking the kids what's going on here, and the Iraqi children said, "Yeah, that's the Syrian kids. They're stupid. They're dirty, and so forth." Like, uh, okay, um, so I went to the principals and same story. And it's like, yeah, but there's enough space. They can join us. Is it okay for you? And the, uh, the, the teachers basically said they hate each other. Uh, they will never play with one another. So what has happened was basically, um, you know, Iraqi refugees came to Syria and uh, the UN built a school. Um, great, but in a very poor neighborhood. And... The, you could really see the difference as well. So the Iraqi kids, they got like a school uniform, they got, you know, activities, and the Syrian had nothing, basically. Yeah, so they were jealous of the Iraqi kids and, you know, their activities and, and so on. So there was this fight since like four years already. And uh, I was like, okay, um, it was only once a week. So we came back next week and we managed to get two of the Syrian kids um, to join the class. So they didn't really want to play with the Iraqi children, but they liked the instruments and liked the music we did, of course. They were all, you know, watching over the over the, the wall. And one was playing an agogo that's which looks like a coconut, very easy to play. And the other one wanted to play the pandero, which is the tambourine. So and basically they made the music for the Iraqi kids. Um, and by the end of the class, the girls came, we played some music together, and um, everybody went home, and no stones. Um, the third time we came, um, the Syrian kids had brought their friends. <laughs> they, uh, um, they, they still didn't want to play with one another, but capoeira doesn't work like that. Basically, you know, you shake hands, you change your partner, new exercise, you change your partner, you change your partner, until you end up playing with everyone. And after the fourth class, um, the Syrians and the Iraqis, they were already practicing together before we came to, to the class. And um, the, the teachers couldn't believe their eyes. Yeah, to, but I mean, for, for, for me, you, I don't know, who, who practice capoeira, um, it's something, you know, natural. You know, music, sport, play are like essentials. We, we need this to live, we need this to express ourselves. These are basically the right ingredients to create you know, a, a really good environment, a healthy environment to solve problems as well. And for example, this is like one story which really describes the power of you know, sport, music, play 
uh, in such difficult um, you know, circumstances. It's a great story. How has the organization changed? You know, here we are now, we're talking about it, where it's at. Clearly, there, there's, there's a website, there's a mission. But if you look back to the early days, maybe before you'd even named it, how has Capoeira for Refugees changed? Um, yeah, I mean, we went through lots of changes. Um, I mean, the beginning of Capoeira was basically sitting you know, around the fire, wanting to do more, helping. Um, and we had to structure and the mission, and, you know, all of this bureaucracy, basically, you, you need. Um, we, I think while we were in Syria, I mean, we created you know, hundreds of jobs, trained over 70,000 children you know, affected by war and conflict. And when, let's say, I had to leave Syria in 2011, so the, the war started in 2010, so I was well, basically almost a year as well still in Syria. Um, we had to find ways to, to keep the, the people supported. And there are ways, uh, ways. I mean, we live in a world which is global and local and technology basically made it possible for us to connect still to the trainers, the Syrian trainers we, we trained and helping them. But it's of course something else if you sit on your computer and trying to help somebody uh, you know, in a different space. So you, we had to do a lot of you know, monitoring, evaluation, you know, we have to get qualitative data, quantitative data, writing budgets, what are the tasks, financial data, and so on and so on. So it gets a lot of bureaucracy, basically more bureaucracy basically came on us. Um, we um, started, um, opened an office in Palestine as well, um, where there were already capoeira and really good trainers already. But I think we managed to sensitize a lot of um, trainers um, to work with children in refugee camps as well. Because people would love to do that, but we basically supported this, the whole infrastructure. And I think one big achievement of Capoeira for refugees um, was to put Capoeira as a, as a, you know, as a whole on the humanitarian uh, map, basically, before Capoeira wasn't really used for um, you know, projects in conflict zones and so forth. There's a lot of tiny projects here and there, and they're doing amazing work, um, but never really recognized. And I feel what we have achieved with Capoeira for Refugees, this is then, you know, let's say the advocacy part we're doing, you know, working with uh, tons of international organizations, um, knocking and shaking uh, basic trees with um, UN organizations or in, with Brazil and the embassies or Itamarachi, the, the ministry in, in, in Brazil. So we basically have done a lot of advocacy basically for using capoeira in, in war and conflict as a tool for you know, psychosocial support, mental health, building communities, and so forth and so forth. Um, so we always closed our office after three years in every country. It's also Jordan where we had an office um, until recently. So I just moved to Berlin one and a half years ago before I was in Jordan, um, where we're running Capoeira projects in you know, refugee camps and host communities and so forth. Um, but what we always have was we had really passionate um, teachers, basically. But you really, it, it's, it's a lot of work for the, for the teachers because there's a lot of traveling involved. Um, there's all the bureaucracy around it. Um, the pay is really bad and not secure so how long can you do what we really want when you have lots of short-term fundings and so forth so it's to keep the whole thing together in the life basically that um really was like weighing was weighing me down because in the aid sector um each organization is competing with each other like for money for visibility for paying the employee salaries and local initiatives are struggling to survive um, day by day. They are basically worn down by bureaucracy and only large organizations um, are able to handle the bureaucracy and they have access to money, but not the small organizations. So we are a small organization 
um, in comparison. So we, let's say when we're looking again, how, um, let's say, Capoeira for refugees change, we have always a lot of good intention, work 24 hours, no weekends, no salaries, and so on and so on. But um, we basically got really frustrated with the, um, with the whole sector, the charity sector, because we want, you know, we, we, we know what capoeira, what different does it make, but to market it, it's a different job. It's not nothing to do with capoeira, it's marketing <laughs> or mm -hmm. fundraising. And so you need a lot of different hats all the time on. And if you only run with like lots of voluntary support, so it's basically very, very difficult. And I think over the last um, couple of years, I think what we really, I think, did really well was basically trying to hand over the projects we created, we started with our partnerships. Um, and the local trainers, they kept on working with those organizations. And we're happy about that. So we, are, we love and we're still supporting many of those organizations which were originally started with Capoeira for Refugees. Office was closed. And then the local organizations that registered the local organization, uh, organization, and then they basically kept working with, you know, Nor Norwegian Refugee Council or Relief International, uh, uh, GIZ, IRC, Save the Children, and so forth. And we are still supporting them, um, which we can do um, quite good now being based in Berlin, because here you have a network, here you can do more fundraising and uh, creating partnerships and so on. This is basically what I'm doing in Berlin since I moved here, um, trying to change um, the system of, you know, of aid, basically. Um, let's say the, the challenges local organizations are facing. Because um, I, I don't know, you know, there's basically less than 1% of aid money, international aid money goes to local organizations. 99% goes to large organizations, right. uh, not to local organizations. And this is what Capoeira for refugees had to face with. And that's what like thousands, hundreds of other thousands, other really great projects basically facing. And this is something what I'm basically trying to change here in Berlin. Mm. Now, I just want to go back just for personal reasons. You mentioned ISC, Institute for Sustainable Communities. Is that who you um, ISC is, uh, my God, International Relief Agency. It's a big uh, international American NGO. Okay. Uh, international Relief Agency, I think, is that called. Like basically, those large international organizations, you can basically name any. They are pretty much operating the same. Well, the the reason the reason I ask if it's ISC if if that's who you mean by ISC is International Rescue Committee. Here we go. That's oh, okay. All right. I, I, ISC yeah. is based in the town I live in. Ah, okay. So I, I was just curious. They're they're one of the organizations that um, the the philanthropic side of Whistlekick we've we've given them given them some money. Ah, okay. They're, they're oh. a good group. So I was I was hoping that some of that money you know flowed flowed through to you, and I could say you know that I was I was very happy to hear that, but. Um, I guess not. We'll, we'll have to do something a little more direct next time. Yeah, no, the, the rule of thumb is basically don't trust any organization over 100 employees. I think this is something you can basically measure with. Well, one of the things that we've gotten better at, I, I don't know what's going on there. Are you okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, no, it's okay. The door but... went open. I'm, I'm working in a very nice vegan uh, cafe and we have the whole um, like shared office space. Sure. So we have really nice food and cakes, but um, we have also <laughs> kids sometimes coming in. So I just it sounded just, like a monkey. Yeah. Here in the United States, we have organizations that will publish what percentage of donations ultimately go towards the mission. So we, we've, we've gotten better at being aware of that here in the United States. So hopefully that, that starts to spread as well. Because it's important. It's important to know you know, where does your money go and, and what, what is it used for? Yeah, but it's numbers, you know, you can say my pen is direct project cost because I really need it for my running my project or not, you know, and so it's basically, it's only deep. There's not really, um, yeah, it's not really defined well enough. There are initiatives which are great. Um, there was, for example, this grand bargain initiative 2016 where, 
uh, like large humanitarian organization came together, the UN organizations and over 20 governments to change that figure from, you know, under 1% of international aid goes to local organizations to 25% by 2020, which is mm. next year. We are far away from making that happen. There is a lot of goodwill and there's a lot of, let's say, aligned long-term goals, but everyone has a different short-term goal. Sure. I understand. Yeah. One of the things that we talk about here on this show is who you would like to train with. You know, this idea that, that martial artists of different types all over the world, you know, we talked before we started our recording that we have a lot in common. So maybe it would be through a couple of different refugees, maybe not. But if you had the opportunity to travel, to train with someone that you looked up to, who would that be? <laughs> Uh, well, that, that's a really difficult question because, like I said, the capoeira thing is more more like a tool rather than physical fitness and, and so forth. So for me, I would train with somebody who has a really nice energy, you know, could be maybe who somebody plays very well, music, singing. Can that person be dead or alive? Does it matter? Does it matter? <laughs> yeah, I would definitely play with uh, having Bob Marley as part of the... Um, you know, harder <laughs> singing. That's a great think, answer. That, that's you, think, you're the first person to mention him on this show. Yeah, if, yeah. I, he was a good football player, right? I I can't speak to that, but it wouldn't surprise <laughs> me. I mean, he has a really good energy, and this is somebody I really would love to have in the same room and basically doing training with. Yeah, he certainly had rhythm. It, yeah, he definitely. And had. if you have rhythm, you can figure out capoeira. Exactly. Exactly, this is what it takes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's always been my, my most difficult part when I play. Ah, uh, capoeira, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's like learning a language, right? No? So you're getting the letters together, and then you can build sentences, and you can talk at the end of the day, right? Like exactly. time, yeah. When you're not playing, when you're not running this organization, what are you doing? What, what else is part of your life? Um, what I'm doing, so I start teaching welcome classes here in Germany again with capoeira sports a lot in uh, twice a, a week. Just like I said, I, I was just so frustrated with running and managing stuff that I really missed ha having like, like working with children directly. So this is what I'm doing. I have two kids, two and four. Um, what else I'm doing? Yeah, I'm setting up this new company, um, Frontline 8, which basically is like, um, Lots of tech related things to help our and other projects more efficient, basically to help make our desire to help more efficiently. Um, so, this is something where I'm spending quite a lot of time in, uh, with. Um, I'm doing a lot of advocacy um, for um, basically localization of aid projects so that the support goes to local organizations, not to the bigger ones. Um, um keeping the the back of my my wife free so she writes a book uh, about united nonsense <laughs> which is um will be released early 2020 um you know which talks about the whole sector and also about the story of poeta for refugees basically going through you know different countries and trying to um help basically as many other grassroots organizations and what sort of difficulties we had to face. And basically the system works as a, you know, it's a bit like a cartel structure, you know, only, like I mentioned before, only large organizations, they know the right people, they can handle the red tape, but not the smaller uh, organizations. So I'm doing this as well. What else I'm doing? Yeah, I think that's, that's probably it. Um, yeah, I'm still quite busy. I think I'm more um, focused because um, yeah, I don't. I think I don't really have the luxury anymore just to try this and try that. I'm um, having those few projects I'm working on, helping, volunteering here and there as well. Um, yeah, I think that's that's where my time goes. Mm. It's a great place for sure. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's let's talk about the future. We've talked about where you started. We've talked about where you are. Where are you hoping to go? And I don't mean just you personally, but also the organization. Let's talk about both sides of that. Uh, where we go with us, me, organizations. I mean, what we're trying to do is 
through um I mean, let's say through our work, for example, we work in a, uh, in Syria and El Raqqa, um, which like is the north of Syria. It was the ISIS headquarters uh, for a very long time. So we uh, started a Capoeira project there before ISIS came. And then ISIS came, you were not allowed to you know, play music anymore. They would chop your head off, basically. It was forbidden. But fighting was okay. You know, in Capoeira, you can also sell as a fight if you want to. So there, it was fine. Um, now ISIS left and um, it got totally bombed. Um, so this is a project which, you know, is really close to our heart, uh, my heart especially, but, you know, for the organization because, you know, we know a lot of people. We have created a really amazing network, or let's say supported to create an amazing network, renovated the whole school um, first day, more than 100 kids came to classes, uh, mamas, papas, so basically a uh, it was the place to be and so this is something which i would really like to see rebuilding as well um let's say through capoeira um, supporting them and lots of other projects basically um depending on needs and outcome based resources so to make basically the support we give accessible and fair um which you know, requires for us to do, um, yeah, investment in technology, basically, and making sure that, you know, you, everybody who wants to help, basically, can log in and can create, um, you know, personal connections with the people on the ground and supporting them directly. This is basically where we are heading uh, with the organization. Um, but also, we want to do this you know, make it replicable, not only with Capoeira, we would like to, you know, use the same methodology, which works really well, um, you know, in the context of one conflict for us. Um, and other, you know, projects basically could use that sort of methodology. But, you know, the bottom line basically is, you know, we want to change the system, um, how aid delivery works and, and cut off, you know, cut out the middleman in the development sector, building trust, transparency um, between supporters like you, me, uh, with actual change makers on the ground. Um, this is something where, uh, let's say, I spend a lot of time with, and I think this is also where the organization more and more is basically uh, heading towards trying to yeah, make sure local organization become more support. It's great. And if people want to find you on the web, social media, website, things like that, where would they go? Uh, yeah, there's tons of things. So through my name, you see definitely <laughs> videos um, of me talking in conferences. I don't know, what's on pet and on falling walls and different things. Um, you know, there's a lot of things, basically. I have some blogs from networks. So if you just Google my name, LinkedIn, uh, you can also, of course, look at Capoeira for Refugees org or frontline aid um there you also see a lot of stuff what i'm doing and um i'm always happy if you know like-minded people want to you know help support um you can definitely just reach out to me um so yeah this is basically where you can that there's not so many Tarek al salas here so <laughs> you can easily find me online great and of course folks we will have links to social media and websites and everything over in the show notes page at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Well, I appreciate you being here today. This, this has been great. And, you know, as we often do, we went in a direction that I hadn't expected. So I, I thank you for your willingness to do that. You know, it's clear how passionate you are about all this. And, and I appreciate you being open with that passion. But I, I want to ask for one more thing. Listeners know what this is. And it's, what parting words, what wisdom or advice or however you want to term it, would you offer to the people listening today? Um, so we're talking about people who are doing practicing a lot of martial art, basically, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, I, I'd say 99% of the people uh -huh. listening practice. I mean, I feel like a, a good word of advice was, um, you know, just if, if you can inspire people in your own community uh, you don't need to travel to palestine or syria to help um 
I also fear, um, let's say, when I started back in in Syria, um, I wasn't a capoeira master or something far away from that. But you know, I think if you have the right energy and you can work with children and and you you have a you know, especially if you practice sports, I think you're some sort of person. You don't have problems to stand in front of other people and teach those others. I think it would be great if more people would be inspired to start their own tiny projects in their own community. I feel this is something which, you know, you can really give back to your own community. And I feel that's something um, I always did that wherever I was. And um, yeah, it's just a beautiful deep part of the community and especially for people who are not part of the community, make them part of the community. So I hope um, more people basically starting their own projects uh, wherever they live and also have time to drink tea and basically creating more positive communities. Starting and running a martial arts school isn't easy. Starting an international martial arts organization has to be so much harder. And we got some glimpses into that today. Everyone has a place in martial arts. Some people have a place to participate. Some have a place of sharing. Others have a place of spreading. And I think it's pretty clear that today's guest is doing exactly what he is supposed to be doing. I appreciate all of the work that you're doing to spread martial arts to some people who otherwise may not experience it. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. If you want to check out everything we talked about today from photos, social media links, website links, and a bunch more Head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. This is episode 404. If you go to WhistlekickCom, you're going to find the products that we make, the other projects we've got going on. You can sign up for the newsletter. You can hear about a ton of stuff. It's our online hub for everything that we're engaged in, all for you, the traditional martial artist. Don't forget the code PODCAST15 gets you 15% off anything at WhistlekickCom. Find us on social media. If you don't follow us, you're missing out because we put out some great stuff. And I'm not just saying that because I'm actually not the one that makes it. We are at Whistlekick on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and a bunch of other places. Just search Whistlekick and you'll find us. If you want to email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Nobody else reads that, just me. I hope you have an absolutely amazing day. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 